Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my thanks especially to the committee and uh, in particular to Miriam and uh, of course to Matthew uh, for organizing this session on Afghanistan, which will allow us to talk about what has been happening within Afghanistan in the region and at the global level. Uh, my own association with your group goes back to the early 90s, uh, Oxford University Strategic Studies Group. And I remember we went on a visit to Brussels to visit uh, the headquarters of the NATO, and we were received by senior military and civilian officials there. So we spent about three days, and that was, I think, 1991 or 1992. I remember Greg Robbins, I don't know where he is, but he used to be the convener of uh, Oxford University Strategic Studies Group. So I am one of your old time well wisher. Uh, Afghanistan has been in the news off and on more recently, but there are other international developments uh, which have uh, taken precedence, uh, especially the American elections, and we don't know what's going to happen uh, with the new administration. Some people think the old policies of uh, the Obama administration will come back. Some people think that there will be a, a major shift. Uh, the, um, uh, so, but Afghanistan doesn't get much academic discussion, especially in Oxford and Cambridge, because of uh, long-term kind of division of uh, these area studies uh, program. For example, Middle Eastern studies program in Oxford and Cambridge includes Afghanistan, but generally remains focused on Arab Middle East and Iran and Turkey. And Afghanistan sort of gets ignored. South Asian studies program at Cambridge and Oxford focuses mainly on India, a little bit on Pakistan, but sadly ignores Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bangladesh. So that is why I think um, I noticed over the last 30, 31 years that not many you know, seminars and activities have taken place in reference to Southwest Asia, which largely means Afghanistan and Pakistan and that part of the subcontinent. Um, so I'm glad that uh, your group is organizing, uh, you know, this uh, has organized this session and it will give us a chance to, you know, sort of recap what has been happening in Afghanistan and uh, hopefully things will improve. I have some hypotheses because you are interested in strategic uh, issues and then I go back to my slides and uh, we sort of talk about a little bit of history and a little bit of politics. My feeling is that most of these uh, states, especially post-colonial states, came into being through the territorial arrangements when decolonization was taking place, whether we talk of India or Pakistan. Afghanistan is slightly older but it has this colonial context. I mean the great game between the Tsarist Russia and British India, and that's how the boundaries came into being. And you could say the same thing about Tibet, you could say the same thing about Nepal and many other countries, and more recently in 20th century about Finland. But other than designing uh, these uh, boundaries, most of uh, the um, developments in those countries have been sort of internal and regional. And if there has been any kind of external intervention, it has kind of disrupted uh, that, you know, precarious kind of balance which uh, existed within those countries. And that is what we have seen uh, in Iraq, that's what we have seen in Syria, in Libya, in Somalia, and Afghanistan, that whenever there is an external intervention, you know, a major international intervention, the internal balance in these territorial state uh, falls apart. And then you need lots of time, effort, new strategies to rebuild them. And so we are seeing this happening in, in four or five states, in especially West Asia. My second thesis is that uh, this whole idea of uh, light empire, you know, which was introduced by Michael Ignatieff, the British Canadian uh, politician in the 1990s when Yugoslavia was falling apart really didn't work in, in Yugoslavia and former Yugoslavia didn't work in Afghanistan. So, uh, you know, you can't sort of create a, a kind of imperial control. You may call it light empire, but whatever. I think you need lots of efforts from within and from the outside so that the state system 
you know, survives and becomes stable. Uh, third uh, viewpoint is that uh, with the military interventions or invasions, as in case of Iraq, as in case of Afghanistan, we have seen that the international alliances have become rather marginalized, have been weakened. I mean, this has been happening since 1990, sadly, after the end of the Cold War. Uh, you may disagree with me, but, um, you know, United Nations was marginalized, and in case of Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, we see United Nations again, you know, becoming almost irrelevant, uh, especially the political part of it, the peacemaking and peacekeeping. Um, EU has been also very much um, ambivalent about its role, you know, the way it was about Bosnia or the way it has been uh, about Afghanistan and Syria and, uh, and, and, and Iraq and Libya. Uh, OIC, which is the Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation, has been totally redundant, has been totally marginalized. We don't hear much about it. And same thing with SARC, you know, which is South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. SARC came into being in 1985, and all the nine countries of South Asia have mutual problems. And they, so this alliance sadly hasn't taken off. And in case of Afghanistan, has been totally irrelevant. Nobody talks about SAR. So, so the casualty of uh, these um, conflicts are uh, these multilateral alliances. And I think we need to revive them. I don't know whether Biden um, administration would uh, put more energy yeah, into the United Nations and perhaps a new relationship between the EU and the United States and also you know, Organization of Islamic Conference. I, I, I don't see that taking a, a sort of new shape in the, in the near future. Uh, fourth or fifth element that I've noticed is, especially under Obama administration, that drone technology has been used quite extensively. And it was very controversial in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and uh, because there were six or seven countries, all of them Muslim countries, where uh, predator, uh, you know, uh, Arab aircraft, uh, were being used, and uh, there were civilian deaths, and uh, uh, the idea was that the soldiers should not be involved uh, in, in the operations, military operations, and the drones. And drones have been very effective in terms of taking out those militants, uh, but more recently we have seen drones being used uh, in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and I think Azerbaijan got an upper hand uh, because of uh, the drone technology. The fifth element that I want to mention, and we could come back to all of these, is political Islam. I think political Islam has been a reality, especially in the modern period from the 19th century onward, when Muslim societies uh, were confronted with powerful European empires. And this whole issue of modernity and tradition came along. Some Muslims accepted westernization of modernity, and many Muslims were resistant uh, to this whole idea of modernity because they thought that this was basically Europeanization with this Christian foundation. And that issue hasn't gone away. And um, I think, uh, I'm not saying that the Muslims have a problem with modernity, but uh, Islam is a very political religion because when Muhammad, the prophet, uh, you know, started uh, practicing and preaching Islam, he created his own state in many other cases like Christianity or Judaism or Hinduism, existing states, the empires adopted religion. But in case of Islam, Islam created its own empire. So Islam and religion and politics in the Islamic history are very much interdependent. And there are many, many, several manifestations of political Islam, whether you look at Saudi Arabia, you look at Iran, or you look at Taliban, or you look at Pakistan in the 1980s. So Islam, uh, religion, and politics are intermixed, and there are different models. And this is an area which is worth, you know, looking at. Many scholars have written about it, but I, my worry is that after 9-11, the more, more, most of the focus has been on militant, you know, version of Islam and whole Islamic experience, which is very complex, which is very much evolving all the time, um, has been reduced uh, to one understanding, or, uh, and that is militant Islam. So I think this is where we need to, uh, you know, the scholars have to study how, you know, Islam or 
is 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 a, is a political you know uh, kind of force and um, also of course it's a cultural reality and how it relates or it should relate uh, with the demands of the time uh, in Afghanistan there have been lots of uh, recent developments I'll mention them very briefly but the country itself like any other country uh, is very plural whether you look at uh, ethnicity uh, I mean the largest number of people uh, are Pashtun about 45 to 50 percent and Pashtuns have been largely the dominant force when it comes to political elite and most of Taliban I think more than 90 percent are Pashtuns and one understanding of Taliban is that since Pashtuns were dislodged uh, they have been trying to come back and you know this is how they became the Taliban uh, there are some other ethnic groups uh, amongst the Taliban but predominantly Taliban or Pakistan or Afghan Pashtuns there is a version of Pakistani Taliban and they are predominantly Pashtuns as well but there, there is a different set of issues and challenges in Pakistan. The second major group in Afghanistan uh, are called Tajiks who are Persian speaking and then in the middle the dark green part that is where the Hazaras are. They are the Shias and um, they, some people think they are the descendants of the Mongol uh, invaders of this part of the world and uh, and they are surrounded by these Sunni majorities whether they are Pashtuns or Tajiks and then to the north you have the Uzbeks and Turkoman so this this whole area based on um, I mean this country from 1750s uh, 1760s Afghanistan came into being and there has been a kind of tribal confederation the elite from these different tribes sort of working together in Kabul and that is how a decentralized uh, kind of country like Afghanistan you know survived as an independent country uh, this was I think one of the very very few places uh, uh, in the Muslim world which was not formally colonized and largely there was a kind of understanding between uh, the Tsarist uh, Russia and British India and that is how Afghanistan remained uh, a kind of buffer state uh, the military, um, I mean, there are all kind of figures. There are about 26,000 Western soldiers and Australian soldiers um, in uh, since 9-11. Uh, I mean, the numbers went up uh, during Obama administration. And since then, the numbers have been increasing. And uh, recently, President Trump made an announcement that 2,500 U.S. soldiers will withdraw uh, by the middle of the uh, next, uh, next uh, by the middle of January. So uh, about 2,000 or 2,500 American soldiers will be left, but there are uh, soldiers from Britain and Germany and other places. Uh, so this is a big question, and uh, this is what uh, you know Biden administration has to face. Um, another development has been that Obama's book is widely being debated. This is the old administration. Biden is sitting there when he was the vice president, and somebody somebody has photoshopped it. You could see Osama bin Laden <laughs> standing there because there are still people in the world, not just in Pakistan or Afghanistan, but even in America. I believe that Osama bin Laden was either dead before that operation in May 2011 or uh, this was whole. Uh, this was a hoax because Obama wanted to get reelected. Well, I think Osama bin Laden was in um, Abbottabad. This is another question whether uh, the Pakistani military knew about him. Maybe some people in Pakistani military in the ISI, you know, the Inter Services Intelligence, knew about it. Uh, but um, Pakistani military establishment is also very complex. And there are elements who have got sympathy for Taliban because of India or, you know, or Pashtun ethnicity. We could talk about it. But anyway, um, I saw this uh, uh, Photoshop picture and I thought I'll share it with you because these are the people who are making all those decisions during the two terms of Obama administration. And some of those people are coming back, uh, you know, to run the new administration from the third week of January. Uh, Obama's book uh, talks about the, um, the situ uh, Afghanistan situation where the drones were used in a big way and lots of fatalities. Uh, you know, Obama wrote that the often young men and boys he targeted coat had been warped and stunted by desperation, ignorance, dreams of religious glory. Unquote. At another place, he says they were dangerous. These young men, 
often deliberately and casually cruel. I wanted somehow to save them, send them to school, give them a trade, drain them of the hate that they had been filling their heads, and yet the world they were a part of, and the machinery I commanded more often had me killing them instead. It is very sad because Obama had a long-term relationship with that part of the world. His mother had actually served in Pakistan, uh, you know, and then Obama spent three or four years in uh, in Indonesia. So he had, you know, the, the, uh, he had. I mean, when he came to New York, his earliest closest friends he were Pakistanis, but then he had a very difficult relationship with Pakistan, and of course, like Clinton, he preferred India over. Pakistan. So many Pakistanis felt that Pakistan was being punished um, by o Obama because there were, you know, Pakistan was uh, being asked to do more in terms of, uh, you know, going after the Taliban and uh, Al Qaeda element. But anyway, it's a very still sad story that lots of people lost lives uh, in Afghanistan. Lots of young people lost life in Pakistan, and of course, lots of soldiers, American, British, you know, NATO soldiers lost their lives. Uh, last week, another development, some of these recent developments that I've been talking about, is the inquiry report, Brereton report. You might have read about it um, in the newspaper or when uh, this inquiry report, which was uh, uh, inquiry committee, which was uh, headed by a senior general, Australian general, confirmed the fact that uh, many Afghan civilians were killed, you know, just out of fun for no reason whatsoever. And they were executed to blood junior soldiers and unlawful killings were deliberately covered up. I mean, this is what the report said. And I, it, it, the Australian prime minister called uh, the president of Afghanistan, Mr. Rashif Ghani, to apologize. But this is a kind of story which has helped the Taliban, you know, that, that the whole world is against us. And these non-Muslim soldiers have been attacking us for the more than 200 years. And the, I mean, and and they have, you know, some reason to to justify what they are doing. And so violence breeding violence because uh, they feel that uh, this is the longest war that America has fought. Britain is there for the fourth time. Britain already was involved in Afghanistan over the last two hundred years in three wars. So so all this kind of history is being uh, tailor made to Taliban's politics. Another development um, which happened uh, just a few days ago was the visit by Imran Khan. Uh, you know, Imran Khan was a student here at Oxford and he was the captain of your cricket team. And he has very close associations with this country. Uh, and he, this is his first visit to Afghanistan. He has been always talking about, uh, you know, peace in Afghanistan because he feels uh, that this peace will have dividend for Pakistan for Afghanistan in the first place, and then for Pakistan as well. And uh, this was very good. This is an opening because, uh, the, because the negotiations between the Kabul regime and the Taliban are stalled in Qatar. So they need some kind of push. And uh, this push has to come from the region. This push has to come from Washington. This push has to come from the Arab friends like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and also from London. So I think this, this visit is very important. Afghans need all kind of reassurance. And this year, months have been terrible for poor Afghans. You know, lots of civilians have been killed. Hospitals have been attacked. Taliban say they are not involved in these attacks. And some people think this is ISIS. Some people think maybe this is a faction within the Taliban who wants to carry on, you know, this politics of uh, militant resistance. This is the story of Afghanistan. Through these pictures, I want to show you what has happened with generations of Afghanistan in the last 40 years. I remember in 1980, National Geographic published this picture on your left of this young girl, refugee girl, Sharbat Gulla, who came to Pakistan with her parents as a displaced refugee. And this American photographer took her pictures, and this was on the cover of National Geographic. And it became one of the most powerful, you know, messages about that part of the world, which was brutalized by the Soviet Union, because this was the time when the Soviet Union uh, had attacked Afghanistan in 1979 for, after the communist takeover 
of Kabul. And on the right, you see that lady, because 20 years later, the same cameraman went into the refugee camps. And by that time, she had become a grandmother or a senior you know, person, though in age, she was still in her 30s. And this is, you know, this, this shows the tragedy of Afghanistan, the ordinary people. And that's how she looks now. She has got a number of illnesses and uh, she is tossed between Afghanistan and Pakistan. This is the story of more than 3 million Afghan refugees. And there have been refugees even in the recent months. I was reading somewhere that there have been 300,000 displaced people because of this increased violence in Afghanistan. And uh, those displaced people are within the country. And there are Afghan refugees I have seen and um, I have talked to in Tehran, in Iran, about 2 million of them and about 3 million in Pakistan. And of course, the people who are trying to get to Britain or to the continent, uh, many of them are Syrians. And then after Syrians, the largest number happen to be Afghans, sadly. So this is, I thought I would show you these pictures to show that what has happened to the people. Because when we talk about Afghanistan, people generally talk about military matters. But what about the ordinary people who first because of the Soviet intervention and now because of 9-11, Taliban, and the NATO's warfare have become refugees. So there are generations of these people who are living in, in like in, in these, you know, villages which are already destroyed. And this is where the tribal regions of Pakistan became the center of all kind of activity. So on the one hand, you had refugees. At the other hand, you had Taliban on both sides, and then you had the American drones um, and the British drones. Uh, so this is where this whole politics in Southwest Asia became so volatile and so sad. Afghanistan is sometimes idealized, romanticized, which is very negative because it gives all kind of wrong impressions and wrong feelings to the outside world. The, I mean, this is after the first Afghan war, 1839 to 1842. And uh, when, you know, 14 to 15,000 uh, British troops were defeated and um, were eliminated. They were retreating to India. I mean, they had captured Kabul, but then Afghans came back, and in the process, uh, the true, you know, the troops were eliminated. And this one doctor, Dr. Bryden, was able to get into British India from Jalalabad. And a lady in uh, British India did this portrait. So it became sort of symbol of Afghanistan, a country which is the graveyard of the empires. And I'm worried that uh, this kind of romantic idea, this kind of Wild West image of Afghanistan overlooks the tragedies and tribulations of the people on the ground. I visited this place uh, many years ago. This is where the British cantonment used to be, and now it is part of Pakistan. And the hills and the mountains you see behind this uh, frontier town called Parachinar, uh, is the Bora Bora, which was in the big news after 9-11. So there are these remnants of the British past in this um, part of the world. And uh, lots of books have appeared. Uh, more recently, William Dalrymple and Af Imran Khan himself wrote a book, and he also romanticizes, you know, this Pashtun uh, innate um, sort of nature of being independent and being defiant and being very brave and very masculine, which I think is very Orientalist, uh, maybe Imran Khan, I don't know, but he thinks that he is descendants of uh, these warrior people. Um, you might have seen um, uh, more books. I mean, this is a recent one, Night Letters, which talks about uh, Afghanistan. It's a very good book. I don't know the authors, but it's mainly focused on Hikmat Yar, who is a survivor. He was at the university in Kabul, and then initially um, he was with the uh, Pakistani ISI, and they fought against uh, the Soviets. They were called heroes and the Mujahideen of 1980s, like several other Afghans. And then after 9-11, we see him in Iran, and now he's back in Afghanistan since last year. And more recently, he visited Pakistan. So he is a stakeholder. In the middle is the book that I wrote about Pashtuns, because uh, when Edward Said talked about Orientalism, he mostly focused on the Arab Middle East. 
But I think Afghanistan is one of the most orientalized uh, country or society in the world. And I focused on the Pashtun community on both sides, India, Pakistan, and, uh, and Afghanistan. So, um, and then the places in between uh, by our British uh, uh, politician, Rory Stewart, who walked through Afghanistan following uh, the footsteps of Emperor Babur, who was the founder of Mughal Empire in India. So he covered hundreds of miles from one end to the other. And this was after 9-11 exactly a few weeks, a few days before the Americans and the NATO started bombing Afghanistan. He builds up Afghanistan, he enjoys the hospitality of local people. So Afghanistan has fascinated uh, lots of people from all the way from the 19th century. Or you, you could go back, you know, for, uh, to, to the early modern period, the Mughals writing about Afghans and, you know, especially about Pashtun. So this whole myth of Pashtun resistance and Pashtun um, um, uh, kind of uh, endurance uh, against external intervention um, was solidified during the colonial period, during the British period, and even now, I mean, lots of uh, people write about Afghanistan, they think this is still the wild west of the subcontinent. Uh, Mullah Omar, I mean, this is the only portrait of Mullah Omar, which is shown around, and uh, he was one of those Mujahideen, and he lost his eye, and then he was in a he was teaching in a seminary near Kandahar when uh, the the warlords came back after the Soviet withdrawal, and uh, especially women went up to him because there were all kind of stories about rapes and uh, kidnaps of boys of women, and he gathered his students, and that is how you know this movement in 1994 started called Taliban. Taliban means students. And Pakistanis uh, helped them, supported them, because Pakistanis needed a stable Afghanistan. They had all kinds of ambitions vis-a-vis -vis -vis Central Asian republics, which had recently become independent. And also they wanted to neutralize India. So Afghanistan sadly becomes a kind of battleground between Indian interests and Pakistani ambitions. But anyway, Taliban uh, were the creation of this atmosphere of chaos and disorder. And um, the chap who is sitting here, he is Mullah Zaif. I think he is now back in Kabul. I interviewed him uh, when I was writing that book a long time ago. And this was a time when he was the ambassador because Taliban were recognized uh, only by three countries, uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan. So he was ambassador. Then he was mistreated by Pakistanis after 9-11. But he has done a very good book. So if you get a chance and if you are interested, in what's happened around 9-11 in Pakistan and Afghanistan. His book is very good. He was uh, given to the Americans, to the CIA, and they mistreated him, and then they took him to Guantanamo Bay. So he was in Guantanamo Bay um, uh, for a number of years, and then he was repatriated. So this book was written in Pashto, but has been translated in English. Uh, these are the Haqqani people. <laughs> because um, until recently we used to read a lot about them in the British newspaper and the American newspaper. They are the strongest group uh, amongst the Taliban, but they fought the Soviets and that how they, that's how they built up their profile. And of course, these people got credibility amongst their own people uh, for putting up resistance first against the Soviet Union and then against uh, the United States and NATO. This is the history of Afghanistan. I don't want to go back to it, but just in case uh, you are interested, the country comes into being in 1747 under the Rani Pashtuns, and uh, then it uh, fights three wars um, with Britain, but remains intact. And then you have um, 1978 communist coup, and uh, the communists are pretty fragile. They introduce um, radical policies which do not go well with this traditional society and to defend them and to protect them, Soviet Union sends in uh, its troops, about 110,000, and they stay on until 1989. Eventually they had to withdraw, and many Afghans, and especially the Taliban, feel that they were the cause, they were the major cause of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So there is a sense, there is a sense of triumphalism, and uh, these people, Afghans, you know, of all ethnic grounds, put up resistance. Many of them were supported by Pakistan. There were nine parties 
in Peshawar who were being supported and armed by the CIA, by ISI, Pakistani intelligence agency. And there were similarly nine groups in Iran of Mujahideen who were being supported. And this is how Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, you know, the neighbors got deeply involved. And then we know how Taliban emerged in 1994. And within a few months, they actually captured uh, most of Afghanistan, because I think local people wanted stability, they wanted peace, and then Taliban introduced their kind of political Islam, and predominantly they were Pashtun, and they are Pashtun uh, people. Uh, and uh, then we know what happened with Al-Qaeda, with Osama bin Laden, 9-11 happens, and uh, Taliban go into hiding, or they move into the neighboring mountains in Pakistan, and a few in Iran. But then I think Afghanistan remained in that state of instability and Taliban were able to come back. Though many strategists will tell you that, oh, well, American attention was diverted under George W. Bush to Iraq, so Afghanistan was put on the back burner. I think Afghans put up the resistance. The external forces were not able to establish a kind of strong alternative government and the issues of corruption, instability, and inter-ethnic tensions did not allow that peace and that stability, and Afghanistan sadly missed another chance. Since 2015, Ashraf Ghani has been the president, he has been re-elected, and uh, Americans under uh, President Trump felt that this has been the longest war, and a very expensive war in every sense of the word, so he wanted to withdraw. So he got Zalmay Khalilzad, an American of Afghan origin, to negotiate uh, with the Taliban. Actually, I had, I mean, like several other observers, had recommended that you have to accept the realities of Afghanistan. We may like them, we may dislike them, but Taliban's are Pashtuns who are the majority, and you've got to negotiate with them if you really want to bring peace and stability into this country. But anyway, these negotiations went on for a number of years, and um, on the 29th of February, early this year, an agreement was signed. And now, this agreement has to include the Kabul regime. So Taliban and the Kabul regime have to sit together, have to talk about the mechanics of bringing in peace or interim government, and what's going to happen to Afghanistan next year, or the following year. So that, that has to take place. And that is where we need a big push, a big move. This is when Zalmay Khalilzad and uh, Mullah Biradar, who is, because Omar died you know, a few years ago. We don't know whether he died in Pakistan or he died in Afghanistan. So he was in hiding, but he was still able to lead the Taliban movement. The way Osama bin Laden, whether he was in Afghanistan and later on in Abbottabad, he was able to uh, guide his movement. So, so that after Mullah Umar, we got this leader, and he is the man who signed this agreement on 29th of February with a fellow Afghan. Uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, I remember him when he started as a part-time lecturer at Columbia University. I used to be a visiting fellow doing my own research there, at postdoc. And I used to meet up with him, very, very ambitious man, very capable man. And later on, you know, he, under President George W. Bush, he became the ambassador to uh, Iraq and then ambassador to the UN and also ambassador to Afghanistan. I think he, being a native Afghan, knows that to bring about the peace, you need to take the Pashtuns on board. And that's why I think these negotiations started. And President Trump wanted the American troops out because this is, has been a very long war and very costly. Um, Karzai uh, is there the, on your right. These are some of the folks who played a very important role in the recent history of Afghanistan, sad history of Afghanistan. And these are the people who are going to play a very important role in the years and months to come. Uh, Hikmat Yar is in the middle. Uh, the second person to our life next to Karzai uh, is the present uh, president. And to the extreme right is the representative of the Tajiks, uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, who is heading 
the negotiations on behalf of the Kabul government uh, with the Taliban. And uh, he was recently in Pakistan, which is again a very positive development because Pakistanis generally feel that Abdullah, Abdullah is uh, very pro-India, uh, while Hikmat Yar and the Pashtun Taliban are sort of pro-Pakistan. So this is again the sad Indo-Pakistani politics which uh, is reflected in the turbulent politics of uh, Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan. Um, so I think the, the term, the great game that we generally attribute to Kipling was actually introduced by Arthur Connolly. Arthur Connolly was a British agent who went into Afghanistan and then posing as a Pashtun, he went into Bukhara and this was 1830s, 1840s, and he was arrested, and the, the Bukharans put him in a cell. Actually, I have visited that place, uh, which is now used as a museum of law in Bukhara, in Uzbekistan. But he is the man who gave us the term, the great game. And this great game happened uh, um, in early modern period between Russia and Britain, and then it was uh, taken over by the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, and Afghanistan was a buffer state. And then this balance broke down when the Soviet Union uh, physically attacked um, in uh, Afghanistan in 1979. And then the Americans and uh, Pakistanis and Saudis and everybody else came along and they helped the Afghans against the Soviet Union. And you remember some of these leaders of Mujahideen, some of them now Taliban were actually invited uh, to the White House by President Reagan. And uh, some of these Al-Qaeda people actually were supporting the Mujahideen and fighting the quote-unquote uh, this evil empire. And later on they turned against the United States. And I think the United States just took off. And uh, this is where a power vacuum was created in Afghanistan after the Soviet withdrawal. And lots of things were happening. Uh, all these Central Asian republics became independent and uh, things were happening in Iran, things were happening in Pakistan and India. And at that time, this political vacuum uh, that the American withdrawal created uh, in Afghanistan and the Soviet withdrawal uh, turned out to be a disaster for Afghanistan. And that's where the warlords came in and Afghanistan was in a great mess. And that is how Taliban evolved and they were able to create, uh, you know, their hegemony. So this, and this is where Al-Qaeda also got enmeshed in Afghan politics and a kind of unstable Afghanistan and a volatile region with a political vacuum and international alliances being so weak. That is how we got sadly in a situation uh, like 9-11 and then the whole history is before us. I think uh, what we, are looking at, I mean, some of my Afghan and Pakistani Pashtun friends who keep an eye on politics, they're deeply worried that if Americans withdrew or the far extra, uh, you know, NATO troops and everybody else withdrew from Afghanistan, it will be like uh, what happened in the 1990s. There will be volatility, there will be million mutinies, and uh, lots of revenge politics will happen. So that is one scenario that people are deeply concerned about. And these are knowledgeable people. They're not sensationalizing the situation. They're not saying that the foreign troops should stay on for an unlimited time, but they feel that uh, the foreign troops should not leave all of a sudden and uh, the Kabul regime is very weak and Taliban will come in and they will capture it, they will defeat it, and then there will be inter-ethnic warfare like it happened after the Soviet withdrawal. So that's one scenario. Uh, I don't know how far President Biden would be able to create a transitional stage and how far international alliances like the UN or others would be able to come in. Or maybe there could be a new initiative if America is deeply you know, involved in the UN. Maybe there could be a new initiative. Maybe there could be neutral troops from some neutral country, Muslim country, who could come into Afghanistan, who could guarantee peace for some period of time until Afghans are able to establish good governance. Corruption is a big issue. Violence is a big issue. And this inter-ethnic imbalance is a big issue. 
and number four, the regional powers, Pakistan, China, Russia, Iran, they have their own interests, which are often in conflict, and especially India and Pakistan. They have to be on board. Chinese are watching. They, they, they have their own you know, plans, very ambitious plans with Pakistan, with Iran. And of course, they know that with the rest of Afghanistan, their investments will be in jeopardy. You know, this whole idea of Great Silk Road that the Chinese uh, leadership has been talking about Afghanistan um, is a big part of it. Uh, I've been to Central Asia several times, and uh, there are quite a few, you know, Chinese uh, projects in that area, though the Central Asian republics have to be very careful because they don't want to antagonize uh, Moscow too much. It's a, like, um, um, you know, um, it's, it's a kind of situation uh, in Central Asia, which is, uh, which is uh, not unstable, but uh, these leaders of six, seven countries, they have to be extremely careful. They can't be too close with China, but they don't want to stay too dependent uh, on Moscow. And for them, Afghanistan is a concern because it brings in instability. I have met lots of Afghans in Uzbekistan. Many of them are refugees. Some of them share ethnicity and common history the way they share ethnicity and history with Pakistan. And there are, of course, uh, Hazara Shias um, in Afghanistan. Some of them, sadly, were used in Syria uh, uh, to fight, um, you know, anti-Assad uh, forces. So poor Afghans have suffered from all these counts. But I think uh, Russia, China, Pakistan, India, Iran, Turkey. Turkey is another actor um, in the region. So all these countries, I think they want peace. But we need some kind of mechanism which could bring these actors, regional actors, uh, some big, some not that very big, but very effective, uh, together. And, uh, you know, Afghanistan could see some period of peace until it is stabilized. Uh, last week, last Monday and Tuesday, uh, this actually just five days ago, there was a conference um, in Geneva under United Nations uh, you know, High Commission for Refugees. And, and a new appeal has been sent out uh, to get more funds uh, for the Afghan refugees so that they could go back. But Afghan refugees from Pakistan and Iran would not go back if Afghanistan remains restive and we have these uh, daily bomb blasts in Kandahar or in, uh, in Kabul, as they have been happening very, very recently and very, very often, sadly. Also, we need efforts from these regional neighbors to encourage ethnic groups within Afghanistan uh, to talk to one another. Uh, I know after 9-11, Pashtuns were marginalized, uh, Northern Alliance, which means Tajiks, Hazara, and Uzbeks, they became the stakeholders in, in Kabul. So I think Pashtun uh, and um, Tajiks and Hazara and Uzbeks, uh, their leaders or their tribal chieftains have to sit together. Maybe they need a bigger, what they call loi jerga, a kind of parliament, and they could resolve these issues because lots of uh, people would be looking for revenge, especially from amongst the Taliban, because they feel that the Tajiks and Uzbeks and people like General Dostum, um, they have worked for the foreign uh, powers against uh, the Pashtun. So I think we need that confidence building uh, kind of mechanism. So other than this regional kind of consensus to help Afghanistan, I think we need um, intra-Afghan consensus for reconciliation. And um, I think regional powers, if they stay neutral and just be helpful, in for peace and stability in Afghanistan, um, that will be very crucial. Same way, Russia, China, and um, the NATO, uh, I mean, especially America and Britain, if they make a commitment uh, that uh, they would be more, you know, sort of helpful and uh, the past will be forgotten and new beginning could be made, I think that could also be helpful. So we need three kind of areas uh, where consensus needs building up one within Afghanistan, one within the neighborhood, which should involve India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, China, and Central Asian republics, and Turkey, and one 
at the global level. Only with this kind of consensus, I think peace would be guaranteed in Afghanistan, reconstruction will take place, and then the refugees will go back. So, so this is my presentation. I'm, you know, willing to um, entertain questions and observations if you have any. Uh, but my, my feeling is that um, it's a kind of uh, make or break stage. If Americans lose interest, uh, other troops leave, I think there is going to be vacuum. But at the same time, the Taliban, they want these troops to go so that they could come back into the power. Actually, Taliban were hoping and praying for the re-elections of President Trump, while the Iranians wanted um, Biden to win. So, so as you could see that this polarization, even the internal politics of the United States, um, has been a major uh, sort of bone of contention within Afghanistan and the region overall. But this is my presentation. I do feel that many of you would uh, maintain interest in that part of the world, Southwest Asia, and um, also, um, you know, try, we'll, we should try to think about Afghans as, you know, hum, uh, kind of the, the human tragedy that the Afghans have suffered, uh, especially since 1978, uh, first um, in Soviet Union, then the Taliban, and then Al-Qaeda, and then after 9-11, uh, lots of people have lost lives, lots of um, explosives have been used, lots of modern technology has been tested um, on Afghanistan. And I think this is a country which needs all kinds of human interest, respect, energy, and help. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Malik. Um, so I think we'll move on to questions. Now, because we're using a different platform today, if anyone has any questions, could you say so in the chat and then I'll invite you to speak. Okay, I think okay. Ah, we do have uh, Clara. Yeah, can you read out for me, please? Uh, yes, okay, let's see if I'm unmuted, yes. Um, so, uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. It was really interesting and fascinating. Uh, I do have one question. You spoke about, in the end of your presentation, to so the future of Afghanistan and the need for inter-Afghan uh, reconciliation. And I wonder, do you see uh, a future of Afghanistan as a united nation state? Or would we need to look beyond our present concept of nation states to see a feasible future for Afghanistan? Well, one, my, I'm very positive. I think Afghanistan has been independent for 250 years, whether you like to use the word independent or autonomous. Uh, and I think you've got to give uh, credit to um, Afghans themselves uh, for being able to maintain, you know, their independence or autonomy for such a long period of time, you know, more than anybody else in that region, especially. Uh, the second uh, worry is, or the second view is that Afghanistan is always multi-ethnic. It has uh, very, very diehard, you know, ethnic affiliations. So until a couple of years ago, some people even talked about um, a division of Afghanistan, you know, northern regions, northeastern regions becoming kind of separate Tajik areas. In some areas, you know, like Uzbek areas, either becoming part of Uzbekistan or having autonomy and Pashtun regions, you know, either independent or with Pakistan. So all kinds of scenarios have been discussed. But I think uh, other than its own history, the neighbors, which I have noticed, have a consensus. Whether you go to Afghanistan or you go to the Republic of Tajikistan or you go to Iran or Turkey or Turkmenistan or Pakistan, in India further east, they all have a kind of consensus that Afghanistan should remain an independent country and Afghanistan falling apart is in nobody's interest. So that also helps Afghanistan. So uh, my feeling is Afghanistan will stay independent. China will play a very important role. I could foresee that. And if there is um, 
a better relationship between Washington and Tehran, and better relationship between Islamabad and uh, Washington, I think Afghanistan has better opportunities. Already Qatar has helped, Pakistan has helped, and uh, America has been willing over the last two, three years to talk to Taliban, which was a big thing, which was a revolutionary change. Because all the way from 9-11, you know, Americans have been going after the Taliban. Lots of Talibans have been eliminated. Many of them were taken to Guantanamo. Many of them were mistreated, including the ambassador that I showed you, Mullah Zaif. So there are lots of these stories, but this was a big change of heart. And uh, this happened under President Trump. Under President Obama, I think the emphasis was on getting rid of these quote-unquote bad young men, rather than building up bridges with them. I think Obama administration only used military and loss of those resources on eliminate, trying to eliminate Taliban. I think eventually we have to talk to these people. This is what we have seen in Northern Ireland. This we have seen everywhere else. So you have to, even if you may not like these guys, you have to talk to them, to neutralize them. The way Americans talk to uh, Iran, I think they should have, Obama administration should have uh, talked to Taliban. Our next question, Harold. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Please. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, you you painted a a really kind of depressing picture of competing great power interests and regional power interests, which I think will make it very difficult to reconstruct any sort of peace. And at the same time, it seems to me, given my values, that actually an awful lot of progress has been made in Kabul and other places since the invasion in terms of women's education, in terms of all sorts of personal freedoms. If you look at opinion polling data within Afghanistan, which you can't necessarily rely on, on the whole, people are receptive to and like what's being created. And there is, a, there is an appetite in the country for this. I mean, one example, I had a son who was working there. His, his company had a, a cleaning lady who used to come in to work to clean their offices. Mm -hmm. And they gave her some money and they put her through education. And she, you know, she's, she's now a different person in terms of her self-confidence. The, the levels of medical care and attention that, that are provided are, are so much better. I mean, it seems to me that it isn't all negative what's been achieved since, since the invasions. And what scares me rigid mm -hmm. is that if we just try and go for some sort of a deal, you know, an acceptable deal in terms of the outside interest, in terms of the power brokers in, in Afghanistan, in particular the, the Pashtun power brokers, we're going to lose so much of that and we're going to let down so many people who've invested an awful lot of themselves in becoming different sorts of people in the last 20 years, much freer people, much happier people. And I'm, what really scares me is that we're just going to throw those people away. And I wonder if you'd like to comment on that. But I, I deeply appreciate your concern and your fear. I share the same way, but the thing is that, I mean, Americans, the British, everybody else, you know, has realized that it has been a very costly affair. I mean, in terms of human loss and in terms of uh, resources and in terms of uh, bitterness, that here is one of the most underdeveloped country in the world, you know, being subjected to the longest military campaign ever undertaken by some of the most developed and prosperous countries. So there was a contradiction in that. And number two, I think you're right that uh, many people benefited and um, you know many people became stakeholders and women uh, got uh, especially in Kabul and Herat uh, they got opportunities which were not available to them uh, during the Taliban regime 
and uh, there is a worry that many of these gains will be lost. I think you are very right, but um, I think you can't run complex countries like Afghanistan on the basis of fear. You have to take initiative, and that's where I was thinking that you need consensus, and consensus from within, and consensus from without. In the 1960s, I mean, if you look at the pictures, if you read the books, and if you talk to the people with the memories from that period, people think that was a golden period in Afghan history. Women could go to the university. They didn't have to wear burqa or wear. But then Kabul is not entire Afghanistan. I know Kabul has been very important since the time of Babur, or Ahmad Shah Abdali, or the Mughals, and everybody else. And in the 70s and 80s, again, Kabul was to, to get hold of Kabul would mean that you would control Afghanistan. So, so I think um, on the one hand, there is a fear, but at the same time, I think we need to take bold initiatives. And that is where I think uh, external powers have to reassure all the stakeholders that um, reconstruction of Afghanistan should take place in areas like education, health, and investments. And maybe the Chinese, you know, if with their investment and Iranian with a peaceful relationship uh, with the Americans, perhaps this could give us a little bit of opening. And I think India, Pakistan also need uh, to be tackled here rather than fighting their proxy wars in Afghanistan or in Balochistan, or in Kashmir. So I think we need all kinds of initiative. But um, let's accept it. Afghanistan's uh, elite, most of them have left that country. So that country uh, is left with refugees and huddled masses. And I think we've got to reach out to them. And they have a strong grudge against foreign uh, you know, forces. Forces means foreign countries which have generally used Afghanistan as a battleground. And um, the people who benefited mostly, I mean, because of corruption and all that, or the people who pocketed most of the money that came into that country. So lots of ordinary Afghans are um, upset with their neighbors. They are also upset with the Western donors that the money hasn't reached the grassroots. I think that was one reason that Taliban have been able to sustain themselves that they sort of uh, built up on these local grudges. So I think we have to learn from those mistakes. I, I do share, you know, your, your, your worries. I'm not a pessimist. I do believe in basic human goodness. And I think Afghans, like everybody else, are well-meaning, worldly wise. But I think we, they need reassurance. And that is why I do miss multilateralism or multilateral alliances. They have to come in. They have to fill in the vacuum. They have to reassure these people that they have not been left on their own. Professor Malik, I'm aware that we are approaching eight o'clock, but would you ha be happy to take a few more questions? Oh, yeah, sure, no problem, at your disposal. Um, I believe our next question in the chat is from Edward Howell. Um, mm -hmm. Would you like to present your question, Edward, or shall I present it for you? to read it. Um, so his question is, you mentioned how the West needs to accept Afghanistan as it is, yet also posit the detrimental effects if the US loses interest and to accept Afghanistan as it is, do you think? I think um, generally, um, I mean, America is a big country. It has got lots of uh, obligations, priorities, changing challenges. So, um, but it is perceived as one of the most decisive actors in world politics in countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, everywhere. So I think there is, is a question of expectations and limitations. Think of America feels, or, America, or Washington feels, whether it's under Trump or under Biden, that it can't handle everybody in the world, can't you know, reach up to their that their expectation, then it should really strengthen the United Nations. The United Nations also needs to get involved and um, it should assert itself. I mean, in areas like health, WHO, or in um, terms of helping the refugees, United Nations has been very active. I'm not rubbishing the United Nations, but I think most of the problems where the refugees um, are the results 
uh, is, is because of the political conflict. So that is where the political you know, uh, uh, will is needed. To, to build up the United Nations so that the refugees don't happen, that, you know, crises don't happen, or if the crises happen, we could manage them. So as a peacemaker and a, as a peace manager, I think United Nations, same way, uh, EU, EU is one of the biggest donors. It has given lots of money to Afghanistan, it has given lots of money to many other places, but without any kind of political role, and then just playing second fiddle uh, to military interventionism it has not uh, gained much confidence amongst those people for the EU. So EU would have to uh, sort of, um, you know, look at these issues in a, in a different perspective. Uh, so multilateralism is a way forward where I think um, American people, you know, the, the enlightened public opinion uh, should really take the public world opinion along because after all these sacrifices and money and you know trillions of dollars um, you know wasted uh, at least uh, this is time to learn we can't manage the world but we could make an effort with others to make it a bit more peaceful and uh, more mutually respectful so on the one hand uh, you know trump is taking the, uh, you know troops out but on the other uh, end when he got into the White House, uh, he made Islam into a big issue, Muslims into a major issue, and um, you know, people from several Muslim countries could not uh, get visa to get into the US. So I think these contradictory policies uh, have to be addressed, and uh, the world is a complicated place for everybody, and we have to learn, with, uh, learn to live with these complexities and complications. We can't look for heroes and villains. So I think we need multilateral kind of world and we need to, and I think the future challenges for America and the American government would not only be issues like Afghanistan and Iran and Syria and Libya and Somalia, but I think issues, how to deal with Russia, how to deal uh, you know, with China. I mean, I attended this seminar earlier on and Jeremy Bowen and other people were speaking about uh, Syria, you know, the seminar was organized by St. Anthony's College, and um, Obama withdrew from Syria. When, was, when it was time to be more assertive in Syria, you know, a power vacuum was created and Russia came in. Now, Russia is the most powerful actor in the Middle East or in Syria. So I think Washington has to deal not only with these little guys, but also with the big guys like China, and Russia, and also with the EU. And collectively, a new world order can be created in the larger interest of the world. I think this is the biggest lesson we can learn from the sad history of the last 20 years. We have one more question in the chat from uh, Graham. <laughs> Sure, go ahead. Uh, well, I think we'll um, move on to the next question and if Graham's unable to um, mm -hmm. join. I think we have a question from uh, Sam. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. The question is, um, does Huntington's clash of civilization uh, explain why Afghanistan has continually been conflict? Well, very good question. And uh, after 9-11, uh, Sam Huntington was revived. You know, when Professor Sam Huntington, late Sam Huntington, came up with his hypothesis, which actually was given by Professor Bernard Lewis in one of the articles, then it was picked up uh, by Professor Sam Huntington, and then he wrote a book about it. In the 1990s, people thought, no, it didn't make any sense. Though he wrote it within the context of uh, the crisis in the Balkans, Yugoslavia. But 9-11 revived it, and many people thought that uh, Sam Huntington was right because Osama bin Laden was using the terminology from the medieval period, the Crusades, and George W. Bush and many other Western leaders used the terms, you know, which were based on this whole understanding of human history in reference to aged, old problems or conflicts between Islam and uh, Christianity. 
and um, Western civilization was sadly reduced to uh, just two faiths and other pluralities were totally ignored. But I think over the years we have discovered that um, the world history can't be reduced just to conflict. There are areas of confluence, civilizations have very fluid borders, they learn from one another, the way Islam is part of Abrahamic traditions, it learned from Judaism, it interacted with Christianity, and it also, you know, bequeathed lots of things, intellectual, cultural, you know, even architecture during the medieval period when Muslims and Europeans were fighting what we call the Crusades. So I think um, looking at history, human history or politics, especially in the 20, 21st century, only in terms of black and white or clash of civilization is very, very simplified. I'm basically a historian and I don't think the world is um, black and white. It has lots of gray areas and that is where Sam Huntington missed out. Uh, Tariq Ali, you know, one of your former students in the 60s, the Marxist uh, writer based in London, and he was the president of Union, I think, in the 60s, and worked with jo uh, with Bertrand Russell, uh, anti-Vietnam. He came out with a book during that period after 9-11, and he called it the clash of fundamentalism, that there were fundamentalists of two different kinds, you know, putting the entire world um, in jeopardy. And I think that also made some sense. And uh, because people were talking about new cons in America, how they had their kind of ideas and their their whims and their you know utopias about the Middle East and uh, about the world and uh, all that, and how America has to be very active in terms of uh, as a military power to create a different kind of world by using its force. And then there were Al Qaeda and such Islamist groups who had internalized a very selective uh, uh, understanding of history and fighting holy war, jihad against non-Muslims. So, so I think there are all kinds of hypotheses, but my, my submission is that human life, and especially when we talk about the world, uh, history and politics, it's not so simple. There are areas where they meet, there are areas where they compete, there are areas where they conflict. Some of the most, uh, uh, taxing uh, wars and um, tragedies have happened within Europe, which is predominantly Christian. So if you think Europe is one solid, you know, civilization, that how come we had First World War, Second World War, the Holocaust, ethnic cleansing in the 1990s, all those kind of horrible things. So how could we then believe that this civilization is just one unit? How could we say Islam is one civilization when Iran and Iraq fought for 10 years? you know, with Saddam Hussein in Iraq and Khomeini in Iran. And so there is intra-Muslim, I mean, look at Syria, for example, all the regional powers sadly are involved, and that's why you end up with Syrian refugees. So I, I think looking at world in terms of monolithic identities and always in conflict um, is, is not the proper way. So I don't see 9-11 and all those events in terms of civilizations uh, conflicting uh, with each other. I hope it answers your query. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll end things there since it's quite well past eight o'clock. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Malik, for your truly insightful and very topical talk. Um, it's been a pleasure having you to speak. My pleasure, um, and I uh, wish you all the best, and uh, I'll invite your uh, colleagues to read uh, my book on the Silk Road where I talk about these cities, not just the Silk Road in uh, uh, contemporary context, in historical context, how different societies, communities interacted, how cities like Bukhara, what, Oxbridge of the medieval period, how Fez remains uh, one of the surviving medieval cities in the same kind of ambience. So, so maybe we could have discussion on on these things in, in our future program. But thank you very much for inviting me and wish you all the best. Thank you, Professor Malik. Uh, next you. week, the OUSSG, um, next Tuesday will be our final live stream of term. Uh, we'll be held with um, direct, uh, Dr. Robert Blair, Director of the Democratic Erosion Consortium and Assistant Professor of Political Science and International and Public Affairs at Brown University. 
Dr. Blair will be speaking on the effects of political polarization and democratic erosion. And we hope to see you all there. <laughs>